Hello students and friends. This is Del Ballou. I am working today on another of my unfinished paintings, one that um, I started a while back. Sometimes I will have two or three paintings started at one time so that I can take advantage of the paint that I have out on my palette. And so today I'm going to be working on um, putting the foreground on my sand. Um, you'll notice I have a piece of narrow masking tape here um, to create my horizon line and it's just a lot easier than um, having to be very careful with your paintbrush and still at some points that may be an issue but I'm going to be working somewhat um, on this cloud shadow because it's a little too purple to suit me but you can do whatever suits you best. Now if you haven't been with me before um, I invite you to go to other videos on YouTube and you can get um, probably a little more complete painting that way. But I wanted to talk to you a little bit first about laying out the palette and the paints that I use. And if you've already heard this, of course, just fast forward through it. Now, I had originally worked with this palette, and I didn't get very much work actually done on um, using this paint before the paint had a seal formed over most of them. Now, the warmer colors don't create the seal quite as quickly as the cooler colors do. And these are the cooler colors here, and these are the warmer colors. Just think sun, yellow, warm, and uh, blue sky as cool. Now, um, what I have done this morning is to go in and lift up these color seals and then just pull the paint right out from under them and then move them over to my fresh palette. And that's what this is going to look like. Now, I haven't put out a lot of color today because I'm just not going to need that many colors, but I have my paints out here, the colors that I want to use, so in case I have to reach over and add some more. Now, I've only, I have not put my cadmium red light out. That's a more orange red because I really don't think I'm going to be needing it today. Now I, I tend to be a little on the skimpy side with the colors that I put on my palette to work depending on how much time I think I'm going to be able to work. But let me give you just a rundown on what these colors are. This is Payne's Gray. I use Payne's Gray a lot for shadow areas and I add blues and sometimes uh, reds to them to change the color temperature of my shadow and it makes a good black but I still wouldn't suggest that you use uh, straight Payne's Gray on your uh, shadow areas. You should tone it somewhat. Now this is um, Hooker's Green I believe it may be sap green. Let's see what I have here out. Uh, it is sap green. This is Viridian green, which is a cooler green. And this is cobalt blue. And this would be Prussian blue. Um, a lot of artists I've noticed like the ultramarine blue. And that's just a matter of taste. Now, this is... Um, titanium white. White also comes in zinc customarily, but I prefer the titanium. The zinc is a little bit more warm than I like it. This is cadmium yellow light, cadmium yellow medium. The cadmium red light would be here and cadmium red medium would be here. I have several shades of red which I like when I'm going to be using a lot of red. This is alizarin crimson and this is burnt sienna 
I really like this color for browns and very warm shadows but it's a matter of taste and as you paint more you develop the taste from experience so I'm going to uh, get busy finishing this up because this painting is 12 by 24 it's not very large I'm going to be primarily using smaller brushes um, this is going to be my reference photograph um, I have hundreds of photographs of um, ocean waves of waves breaking on the sand and waves from different angles and sea oats from different angles I have um, sand dunes in different shapes I like this one because it's more interesting than some of the ones I have done usually I just kind of do them out of my head but I'm going to use this as a reference photograph and some people don't think you ought to use photographs and I think they're great for reference material but that's entirely up to the individual doing the painting and if it works for you good I do want to mention that you should never use someone else's photograph these photographs were taken uh, by me and if you ever do use someone else's photograph then be sure that you get permission and it is it's permissible to use another person's photograph if you're only taking out a part of it but if you're going to just copy straight out then I would recommend that you go and get your own photograph or that you contact the photographer who took the original picture uh, because it would be a copyright infringement okay um, the brushes that I use especially for smaller beach scenes um, and this one is my favorite for getting very long strokes because it does hold a lot of paint and it is a Princeton Art and Brush Company and it's called um, an extra long liner and you can see it has extra long fibers so that's my favorite then there are um, craft painter liners um, I used to get these in the craft departments of discount stores but a lot of discount stores are not carrying many craft items but you can find these in other stores um, some of mine are Robert Simmons so that might be an issue for you in locating them um, this is a zero and this is a one the one works very well when you get down to the bottom portion of your sea oats um, this one is a one stroke brush and it has little thicker uh, bristles but they're still long so again it depends on what what particular item you're working on um, this is a small um, really a wonderful brush if you're working on miniatures um, for carrying a lot of paint and it is um, let's see it's a number two and it just says USA as far as I can tell and this is just a white bristle brush a small brush and this also I use for the the base of my um, sand dunes and sea oats and for doing detail in my water because it's it's a rough brush and it allows me to do some um, some stippling and some uh, you know just some scumbling over the top now um, it's also a good idea and I'm just telling you these things because it's what I happen to have out today it's a good idea to have a good pair of pliers that you can use to 
uh, unscrew the tops of your paint because they will get stuck significantly sometimes. And I use um, odorless turpentine for oil painting medium and I just take a just a discarded jar and I put a plastic pot holder in the bottom and that keeps the sediment from the paint that settles and right now the top part of this pot scrubber has nice clean turpentine. I will be stirring it up. But what the pot holder does basically is it gives you something to wipe your brush off as you go along. And another important element is um, what I use is Liquin Original by Windsor & Newton and it is for oil paint but it will extend the paint without um, without di diffusing the paint when you put your brush into it and it will make it dry faster so if fast driving, drying and a little bit of a gloss is something that you like to have in your painting then by all means use that um, well I'm going to quit talking now for the most part and I'm going to start working I will be speeding up the film but I will interject some things along the way as I think that you need them. Um, I use also some soft um, bristle brushes so that um, you know in areas where I want things to be smooth I will have that texture as well and there are thousands of different brushes you can use and I would I would suggest that you experiment with some if you're new to painting now this this part of my canvas has already been painted. Um, the underpainting is acrylic. I do that because I don't want to have to fool with the white canvas showing through. But this has been painted over with oil paint with a combination of blue and white and just the slightest touch of alizarin crimson. And the mixture depends on your choice, what you like. If you like a little more purple sky, then add a little bit more of the alizarin crimson. And the alizarin crimson is um, this red-purple color. Okay, so I'm going to get started. As I mentioned, I'm going to be working a little bit on the sky. I don't want these clouds to be uh, exceptionally busy so that they draw away from the rest of what's going to be happening here. But um, I'm going to get busy and I will... Um
Okay, let me uh, pause the video at this point and talk about what I've done so far. I'm using, um, if you saw the beginning of my color mixture, um, I started by mixing some cobalt blue and some of this burnt sienna. And it really got just a little too muddy, but I had to try it out on the canvas. And now what I'm doing, uh, since my initial mixture, I've been um, pulling from the cobalt blue and the burnt sienna and really kind of mixing them on my canvas more than anything else. But right now it looks pretty dirty, but um, for the most part that's what it's supposed to look like. Um, because this is the ground underneath the sand. And I have run this darker color all the way up uh, almost to the tape, but don't put it on the tape because it'll create a rigid line which you do not want. Uh, you want a nice straight line for the top of the the ocean because that's the way it looks in the horizon. But uh, you don't want it to be the same down here. Now I'm going to be taking this tape off to work on my water, but for right now I've got a kind of ghost image of where my sand dunes are going to be and um, I remind you I'm using this photograph and I'm going to come back and do some more dry brushing with white to highlight the sand area but this sand is not um, totally white as you can see it's um, you know it has a very warm white glow to it though this is not an extremely bright sunshiny day which I really don't like to do anyway I prefer um, days when it's overcast at the beach okay so I'm gonna let this dry a bit but I've been doing a lot of dry brushing on this and so it doesn't have thick paint it's not going to take very long to dry but in the meantime, I'm going to work on the ocean. And I'm going to be working primarily with that small white bristle brush that I showed you. And if all goes well, I'm going to be able to put some more tape down to protect my sky area. In the meantime, I'm also going to take a ruler or a tape measure and I'm going to tape and, you know, make up for some inadequacies that I might have in my horizon line. Um, I did do a little bit of changes in the sky to keep that purple from jumping out, but so far so good and if you know anything about clouds at all if you've been a cloud watcher as um, if you haven't been in the past you will be as a painter for sure um, but clouds come in all shapes and sizes and they change just in seconds they've completely changed so whatever cloud formation you choose to put on your painting I'm sure there's been a formation like that at one nanosecond in time somewhere in the sky but if you like what you've achieved achieved just go for it okay so i'm going to be measuring now <clears throat> excuse me and then i'm going to put my tape back on but this time i'm going to put it up here um, so that i can work on the water so um, stay tuned i'm coming right back three and a half on that end and it's three and a half on this end so I'm in pretty good shape let's see what it is in the middle and three and a half in the middle I'm pretty sure I probably measured that initially Thank you. 
Bring that back up. Trying to make sure I got that number one. And just to be sure, I'm going to measure again. Now, this is apt to change when I start painting, but I will at least have begun. Okay. There. Okay, I'm in pretty good shape. Thumb along the edge where I'm going to be painting so that the paint won't slip up under it like it came down under this part. And as you go along in your painting days, you will find things that work better than others. You'll discover from watching other people paint or from being in a class or you'll just be wise enough to figure it out for yourself but this is going to be now the top edge of my water in the horizon so using my small brush um, it's always a pretty good idea to tone your colors down. So let me mix some cobalt blue and just a touch. And by the way, when I say a touch, I really mean a touch. See that little alizarin crimson right on the end of there? Uh, just a touch. And I always add it to a little side section of the paint that I'm mixing so that in case it's not right, I can make adjustments. And then... I do the same thing, um, and this is hard for some folks to understand. Um, this is too dark right now, and I want to bring in a little bit of white, but I bring it over to the side so that I get the mixture that I want. And not only that, if you want more than one, um, one shade of blue or value, then you already have it mixed. Okay, so that's going to be my, my beginning patch. I'll be adding color to that and changing my stashes as I go along. I'm going to bring this in a little bit closer. So that you can see what I'm doing a little better. Okay, and I've, I've wet my brush with my odorless turpentine and then I've dabbed it on my cloth. This is a cloth that I keep handy so I can just dab off the excess, but you don't want to start with a dry brush. I want to get a significant amount of paint. Now I start 
over here toward the middle and work that way. Then I come back and work toward that part. Um, gives me a little bit more variety in my strokes. I caution painting students about creating uh, repetitious patterns where repetition is not um, not wanted. There are many patterns in nature, but in your painting, you want to establish variety because the way the um, the sun or the light in the room shines on an object changes the color, changes the shadows. Okay, once I got that on the canvas, I realized it needed just a little bit of darkening up and a more neutral color. So I'm adding a little bit of my burnt umber. Because this is a relatively small painting, you want to make sure that um, everything is in perspective. And you can actually do a lot of little strokes, especially after you get this horizon line in. 